Okay, so I will go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today, Brittany Rhodes Cooper. She's traveled to us from Washington State University, um, so we're lucky to have her on this side, and especially with such a beautiful day. So Dr. Rhodes Cooper is an assistant professor of human development and graduate faculty for the Prevention Science PhD program at Washington State University. Um, prior to her position there, she earned her PhD from Pennsylvania State University in human development and family studies. And from 2009 to 2012, Dr. Rhodes Cooper worked as a research scientist at Penn State's Evidence-Based Prevention and Intervention Support Center, where she conducted research on the primary boundaries to high quality implementation and sustainability of prevention programs administered through Pennsylvania agencies, and translated that research to inform the technical assistance the center provided to both prevention program implementers and practitioners, as well as to the policymakers who fund them. Um, in Washington, she continues to pursue this translational research in collaboration with the WSU Extension and their statewide dissemination and evaluation of the Strengthening Families program. So Brittany's speech today or lecture is going to be on how uh, this research informs practice and the Strengthening Families program and lessons learned. So I'll go ahead and leave that to her. Thank you so much. Hopefully this mic is working. Um, Brooks, let me know if it's not. Um, and I'll just switch, yeah, I'll switch over to the, um, my presentation. So I will give forewarning for those of you who aren't familiar with Prezi. If you are at all sensitive to motion, um, feel free to look away. Sometimes it can be a little jarring, the zooming in and out, but um, I thought this was a, a great opportunity to use this kind of medium for this presentation. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really fun and exciting to um, travel over to the west side, and thanks for bringing the nice weather. This has been wonderful. Um, and I've only been at WSU for not even two years yet, so I'm just learning a lot about the state and about um, the two universities, so I'm really excited to get an opportunity to do that today. Um, and you already have kind of a, a basic introduction to my background, but just to, I'm a visual person, so here's kind of a visual map of where I've been. Um, I grew up in Arizona and did my undergraduate at University of Arizona. I got a degree in psychology there. Uh, and then moved to Penn State, and, and you already heard kind of about my work there. Um, and just, as I said, about a year and a half, almost two years now, um, brought me over to uh, the east side of Washington at Washington State University. And uh, I was hired as an assistant professor in um, the Department of Human Development, but another reason I was um, hired was because we just started uh, when I first got there, our, our PhD program in prevention science. So it's a brand new um, PhD program. They had been working for about 10 years to get a PhD program um, around these issues of prevention science. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the field of prevention science because I think that's a little bit of a different perspective maybe than you're used to um, and talk to you about what I think it adds to this field of evidence-based practice. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention that I also have an appointment with Extension. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the state Extension system. Anyone? A couple of you? OK. So Washington State University is the land-grant university in Washington. Every state in the country has um, a state Extension system. They also kind of refer to it as cooperative Extension. Sometimes that's what they say. Um, but essentially, the mission is to bring research to practice, right? So. We have extension um, faculty throughout the counties in Washington State, and I actually was just at a meeting with a number of them around the um, Strengthening Families program in particular. You'll see the role that they've played in promoting the wide-scale dissemination of this particular evidence-based program, but it's an excellent way for me as a researcher to kind of um, extend my reach out throughout the state, learn a lot from the practitioners on the ground doing this work, um, and conduct some of this translational research, which I think is really meaningful. So um, that's kind of the perspective that I'm taking um, and kind of where I've been. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have along the way. I did want to start by just getting a sense for who's in the audience. So um, if you don't mind, I'll do this real quick. Uh, how many of you are would consider yourself researchers or faculty? OK, and uh, community providers, uh, practitioners? About half and half students, graduate students? No, no graduate students in the room? Um, they're eating lunch or out enjoying the sunshine. Um, yeah, OK, so this is great. So we've got a good balance, half and half. Um, so I'll hopefully speak to some issues, both from a practitioner standpoint, but also from a researcher um, and research standpoint as well. I also wanted to just um, kind of hear maybe one or two people give me a sense for what you hope to learn today. What attracted you to coming to this particular session? Is there any one thing that you're really hoping to get out of it? Because I want to make sure I use my time wisely and emphasize those areas you guys are most interested in. Anyone want to share, maybe? 
what they're thinking? Or are you guys just here to learn in general? Yeah. Okay. So what's happening in prevention science, the field, but also specifically within Washington? Great. Anyone else? How many people have heard of the Strengthening Families program? Okay, awesome. Hopefully you've heard of this one because there are a couple of different programs with this name, so I'll try to specify exactly what I'm talking about here in just a second. Okay, great. Well, again, stop me along the way if you have questions or things aren't clear. Um, I definitely want to make sure that you guys get out of this what you're hoping to. Um, so, speaking of prevention science, um, I know that some of you might be familiar with this as a field, as a term, um, but I did want to just kind of give a little bit of foundation so you understand my perspective and also my training. Um, so prevention science, uh, the one thing that I think helps distinguish it or at least um, helps describe it in a way that uh, is a little bit different from maybe a treatment focus is that it really takes a public health approach. Uh, when we talk about public health, we're really talking about kind of a population-based approach. So whereas treatment is often um, at an individual level, prevention scientists and public health um, folks tend to look at broad public health problems or look at from an epidemiological perspective, what are um, the prevalence rates of certain problems or issues in the communities that we're interested in, uh, what particular subgroups or groups of people might be more at risk for those issues. Uh, we also like to look at what are the potential causes or factors that are associated with um, let's say obesity rates, um, things like that. So what are those things that increase the likelihood of those rates? What are the things that decrease them? The thing from a prevention science perspective we're most interested in is what are the malleable risk or protective factors? So um, although we might say that you know, uh, a particular race or ethnicity or say you know, males or females might be more or less at risk, that might help us target our efforts. But from a prevention science perspective, we're interested in taking those risk and protective factors and developing a program or a policy or a practice to um, kind of change or um, kind of shift those risk or protective factors in hopes that we'll actually end up to this you know, ultimate goal of public health impact. Um, and of course, an important kind of component here in between actually developing a program that works, testing it and figuring out that it works, is this dissemination part. So it's something that we're working on in terms of strengthening families program through the state extension system. Um, but this is a potential area where we need to do a lot more work in trying to understand how to do this if we're truly to get to public health impact. Um, so I wanted to share a quick video if technology is working with me today. Um, every place that says public health, you can play, put in the words prevention When you're sick, diet. you go to the doctor and the doctor treats your disease. They've been trained to do that pretty well. But what do you do when you're healthy? Well, you probably just go about your day. You've got a busy life. We all do. And you can't afford to be sick. So what if I told you there are people out there whose job it is to make sure you stay healthy? And what if I told you these are people you've probably never met? Well, these folks are in a field called public health, and their mission is to promote health and prevent disease. Doctors, on the other hand, are on a mission to treat disease. So let's say this person is diagnosed with diabetes. Now it's the doctor's job to treat her patient. She'll prescribe medications and insulin to help him meet his target blood sugar levels. Unfortunately, he'll have to keep going back for prescriptions for the rest of his life because there is no cure. To make matters worse, he'll have to deal with issues like long-term health complications, health insurance concerns, and even social discrimination. And don't forget his medical bill, almost $14,000 a year. His priorities in life are now secondary to his disease. Sure, modern medicine has come a long way, but is this the best way to address disease? Well, let's take a step back and focus on preventing disease. According to public health researchers, simple things like a healthy diet and regular exercise can help prevent the onset of diabetes. So public health folks put their health promotion and disease prevention mission to work. They lower the prices of healthier foods and beverages in school cafeterias to promote a healthy diet. And they build community sidewalks, trails, and bike lanes to promote exercise. And at a fraction of the cost of disease treatment, public health makes it really easy for people to stay healthy in the first place. No diabetes means no long-term health complications, no health insurance concerns, and no social discrimination. Just health promotion and disease prevention. And the crazy thing is, it works really well. Because people you've never met, people you've never even talked to, devote their time to make sure you stay healthy. I like
like that they depict them as superheroes and Ghostbusters, kind of fun. So yeah, I took this from the UCLA School of Public Health um, website, but I think it also speaks to kind of our, our goals in prevention science as well. Um, of course, this example was an example of preventing kind of physical um, or medical issue or disease. Um, you might automatically think prevention and think diabetes or skin cancer. Um, for the, the world that I live in and the prevention science folks in general, they, they tend to focus on mental, emotional, and behavioral, um, preventing these per types of um, disorders. And so there has been a relatively recent publication um, out of IOM, 2010, I believe, was uh, when this was published. It was actually an update to a 1994 or so um, report where they brought together um, a lot of the prevention researchers in the field to kind of summarize where the state of the science, where we're at, and kind of what the direction is we'd like to go in. Of course, I don't really have to tell you these statistics, right? The, the reason why we think prevention is so important, the fact that there are a number of, um, a great number of youth, um, young people that have these disorders, and that actually the signs for them develop fairly early. Um, so that gives us the information we might need to use some of these prevention strategies. And we've come a long way in the past you know, 30 years or so in developing and identifying some effective um, programs and practices that do target some of these risk or protective factors that we're interested in. Um, and so, and they are, from a prevention standpoint, relatively cheap when we kind of address it at a universal level um, before kids kind of get too far down the road into some more expensive um, you know, treatment and uh, need some more as assistance. So that's the philosophy and um, the idea behind prevention. Of course, it's pretty idealized in a lot of ways, um, but th that's kind of what we're striving for. Um, I also wanted to make the point that, of course, this is a bar uh, part of this spectrum, this intervention spectrum, um, from promotion um, through prevention to treatment and to maintenance. And it's all a part of a larger continuum. Um, and that, you know, although it's, you can think of it as distinct, it is complementary to um, you know, people that are working in treatment. We need to kind of work together um, and speak to one another. And uh, it's a part of, you know, ultimately, we're all kind of after the same goal. So that's, uh, that's just to, to get us started as to kind of the perspective that, that I'm um, taking from this view. The other point I wanted to make is that within prevention, we even have kind of different approaches um, based on varying levels of what I would consider risk for a particular population. So um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on this universal segment of the pie. So these are interventions that are targeted towards entire populations. So we're not necessarily looking for kids or, or families that are higher risk versus others. We want to kind of take a broad brushstroke approach to um, trying to, the, we think this type of program can benefit any family, whether they're higher risk or lower risk. You'll hear it talked about as a strength-based approach. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about also what, you know, what types of families are, are most um, can benefit most from this type of program? Um, but then, you know, as you move up this kind of spectrum, you get into targeting higher risk and more targeted populations. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned, the focus of this talk is going to be around the Strengthening Families program, and uh, there are a couple of different programs out there that use a similar um, name. So just to kind of make sure you guys understand what I'm talking about in terms of this Strengthening Families program. It, developed, it was developed out of Iowa State University. Virginia Mulgard is the original developer, and she worked with Iowa, uh, Iowa State University's extension system um, and uh, Richard Spoth, uh, and he was really the main evaluator or researcher on the project. Um, so then the large number of randomized control trials that have been conducted on SFP and originated at Iowa State. Um, and so it's an evidence-based curricula. It's been proven to work um, to reduce substance use, um, delay substance use, I should say, among adolescents, um, also to decrease uh, conduct problems among adolescents, um, also to increase resistance to peer pressure. Um, around this time period, middle school age kids get exposed to a lot of peer pressure, uh, and also improve parenting skills. So it's both um, aimed at the parents as well as the adolescents during this important transition period. Uh, I did want to point out that you know, it'll, you'll hear this referred to and distinguished from another Strengthening Families program um, because this one is targeted to youth 10 to 14. Um, there's another program that covers a broader range of ages and also that program um, covers higher risk um, populations. This is really a universal program. Uh, so again, to get a little bit more into detail about the, the specific group that it targets, so this is again ages, youth ages 10 to um, 14, so in between fourth and eighth grade. But what they found is that kind of developmentally, 
fifth and sixth graders tend to react best to this kind of program. The younger kids sometimes are a little bit too young to really understand and, and benefit from it. The older kids kind of think they're maybe too cool to, <laughs> to do this kind of thing with their parents. But this is kind of the sweet spot, the fifth to sixth grade age range. Um, and what it's really trying to take advantage of is this transition period. So um, it's targeted towards youth who are transitioning from childhood to adolescence. Um, and also you can think of it from transitioning from elementary to middle school. Um, you know, it's a critical potential um, transition where there could be a lot increasing risk for a number of reasons, developmentally and also just socially. Um, and so they're trying to take advantage of the fact that they're at this transition point. Um, research has shown that these can be really great opportunities for um, behavioral change and um, some of this kind of prevent these prevention efforts. So that's kind of the, the goal here. Uh, also to point out that this need not be targeted towards biological parents. Um, a number of programs involve whoever is the you know, most important primary caregivers in, in the youth's lives. So it could include grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever really is um, considered the primary caregivers. I already mentioned that it's a universal program, so it's strengths-based. Um, their philosophy is that any family can really benefit from these additional skills, even if they think they're doing OK already. They don't really have any problems, necessarily. Um, it really kind of builds the strengths that they have in preparation for potentially some turbulent waters to come. Um, and then a lot of people wonder, well, OK, so you mean universal, but you know, I have these families that I'm working with that are really struggling and maybe are pot potentially a higher risk. Can they benefit from the program? And we would say definitely yes, they can. The one thing you want to be wary of is getting a group of those parents that all are struggling around maybe are a little bit higher risk and um, you know, getting them all in one group, that could potentially be um, a negative experience. So uh, the research would suggest that as long as the group in a particular session of SFP is a varied group with different levels of skills and, um, uh, and potential risk, then that would be a lot more effective. So, any questions at this point about, yeah? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I mean, I know that, I do know that there's at least research to suggest that transition points in general are op great opportunities for, you know, parents are a little bit more open to, okay, they're getting a little scared, like my kids are moving into middle school, that's a little bit of a different territory, I'm experiencing these things that I haven't seen before from my child, they're, they're trying to be more independent. Um, so the fact that people might be more apt to partake in this kind of program, so maybe recruitment-wise, participation-wise, you can take advantage of that. Um, and, but I also, you're right, it's probably also just the, the mix of experiences that practitioners have had. I mean, this kind of fifth to sixth um, grade sweet spot comes from our practitioners who say, you know, when I have younger kids in my group, they just don't seem to benefit as much, but these kids really seem to get, engage and get it. So, yeah, I think it's probably a mix of both. Good question. I think I forgot to repeat your question, but the question was about this fifth to sixth grade sweet spot. Is it research-based or experiential-based? Other questions at this point? OK, so I want to give you um, a good sense for what the program consists of. So this is um, a logic model kind of designed to uh, identify what are the core components, how are they linked to particular um, proximal and more distal outcomes in terms of what the research has shown. Uh, so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the, the components for a second. Um, so this is a seven-week program. It's designed to be implemented once a week for seven weeks um, with both parents and their youth. Um, so they come together usually um, on evenings after school, and they start with a family meal. That's kind of the first um, uh, kind of uh, first part of the program is really centered around just spending time as a family, uh, and it's a really critical piece. Um, a lot of our community members they struggle sometimes finding the funding to fund family meals for you know this group of uh, families, but it's critical. They've shown that if you don't have it, the program is not as effective. Um, it's something about kind of the engagement and uh, just spending that time with one another is really critical. So after family meal time, they go they separate the parents and the youth and the youth youth um, into two groups. And the youth have separate facilitators, the parents have facilitators, um, and they work on similar concepts or similar themes, curricula, um, and, but, but they're working separately for the first portion for about an hour. And then they come back together as a family and there's some family activities, some time to kind of work together on whatever the topic was for the day. Um, so it's about, th so it's three hour sessions for once a week for seven weeks. 
Um, and you know, the goals are kind of specified here, as, as you might expect. The parenting sessions are really targeted around parenting skills, um, kind of enhancing those, um, promoting you know, having, having limits, but also showing love and um, compassion as well. And then the youth se sessions are really focused on skill building for them in terms of what they um, can anticipate moving into middle school, you know, um, developing some of those peer resistance skills, talking through those issues, um, building these general life skills, as we like to call them. And then just strengthening those family bonds. Those are kind of the main mechanisms or things that we're trying to affect. Um, and then to give you a little bit of a, an even better picture of how these sessions go. Um, I have a video here where there are some facilitators that talk about the program from their perspective, from the parents, and then I'm not sure if they talk to the youth exactly, but you'll get a sense for, for this for, uh, from this here. Let's see if I can get it to work. The wonderful thing about the Strengthening Families program is it uses various learning styles for both the adults and the youth. The adult portion is video-based but there are many activities that discuss concepts and also bring uh, the caregivers up front to do little activities to, to move them about the room and get them more connected. In the youth portion, there are lots of games that have actual meaningful um, emphasis behind them, but they're game-like. And so um, the young people learn some important concepts about communication or family rules or societal rules, but in a game type form. Then in the family session, the second hour where the adults and youth are brought together, there are activities that require communication that the families do together. There's a family tree where the families together have to find strengths of everybody at the table in their family. That's powerful. Like, I usually don't get to spend too much time with just my parents. It's nice to have some time with them. They really, they enjoy the, the family activities and just that time that they can spend together. You know, just the fact of being together and talking doesn't cost anything, but they get to spend that time. Every family can benefit from this program. I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, my family's okay. You know, we get along pretty well, but what I find is that this program gives you extra tools. Even if you feel like your family's okay, every, I always feel like anybody can benefit from more education, more tools, being able to improve whatever kind of family life they have. So they really kind of drove home some of those points that I was trying to make. Um, but it's nice to hear from the actual facilitators and parents and families that are involved. Um, I, you know, we've already talked about this, but this logic model suggests that if we improve these parenting skills, increase the youth skills and the family bonding, that we're going to ultimately impact these longer term outcomes. Um, and we do have evidence from the research to suggest that this program can do this. Um, so pretty impressive. Um, the other part of this I wanted to spend some time on is discussing the role that Washington State has played in um, the dissemination of this program, and specifically me, my colleagues and I at, the, at Washington State University. So just to share a little bit of a history, um, back in 1999 is when kind of initially they had the um, idea to adopt this program. And they had identified this middle school age period as kind of a, an area in need, that there wasn't enough programming in that area for parents and families. And so um, they identified strength living families as a way to fill that gap. Um, since then, you know, moving on into 2000, they really uh, started to, br they brought in Virginia Mogar to do an initial training, did a trainer of trainers, and then we kind of developed a statewide training team through the extension um, system. And so they were able to start training back in 2000, start implementing programs soon after that. Um, in 2001, uh, at Washington State, we formed a team to coordinate a statewide dissemination effort, really to put our... Um, uh, time and energy around this idea of kind of getting this program out into as many communities as we could from a training um, perspective. We weren't the ones actually doing the implementing, but we were training communities to be able to do these programs. Uh, and also to focus on evaluation. So um, my colleague Laura Hill um, kind of took the lead on the statewide evaluation. So programs uh, that implement even today um, and are conducting this program, uh, they have some training around how to uh, evaluate it in, in terms of administering a pre and post test with the parents and the youth. And then they send the data back to Washington State. We kind of compile data reports at an individual local level and disseminate that information back to them. 
Um, and they found that it's really useful for garnering additional funding um, to get, get some local support behind the program using some of that data. So that's been another exciting piece um, the, of the role that we've played at, at WSU. Um, moving into 2003, we also got um, a lot of energy around this across the state through this interagency team. Um, people from then DASA, now DBHR, if you're familiar with that group, uh, they put some, some funding around this, um, tried to promote it through their prevention funding streams, as well as some folks from the school systems got involved. Um, this agent or this interagency team was really strong back around this time and did pretty well for a number of years. Um, the economic downturn really um, kind of unfortunately disbanded this group in a way. They just didn't have the funding to bring people together very often. So they don't do this so much anymore. We do it a little bit more informally. But just to say that at one point we did have a lot of um, kind of uh, inertia around the state um, for this particular program. Um, in 2004, they identified a need for a Spanish language version of the curriculum. So they've been working really hard since then to translate um, and make sure that Latino families can also participate. So they have, so they have um, uh, Spanish-speaking trainers now that can go out and, and do trainings across the state as well. Um, then, oh, we fast forward 10 years. Um, this is uh, just to give you a, a perspective on how widespread this has been over the last 15 years or so. Um, we've been able to, as a team, train over 800 SFP facilitators. More than 500 programs have been implemented. And those are just the programs that we know of because they sent us evaluation data. There are other programs out there that aren't even counted in that. Um, and when we look at all the, the pre and post test evaluations, we've been able to um, impact over 10,000 parents and youth. Uh, this map just gives you a visual for where the programs have been implemented. And this is only a segment from 2002 to 2012. Um, but you can kind of see how in some counties it's really taken off like wildfire. Um, in other counties, you know, they just haven't had as much action. But, um, but we have a pretty, you know, broad um, kind of reach across different parts of the state. And this is in large part due to this extension system where faculty are out there in the communities promoting and training and implementing the program. So, um, so pretty fun stuff. OK. Uh, so kind of going back to some of the researchy stuff for a second, um, the reason that I'm really excited about this project and that I initially kind of took this position was because of some of the really exciting translational research they're able to do given the infrastructure that exists um, with this particular program. So I'm really interested in, in trying to bridge this gap. We can all probably recognize and admit that this gap exists and that we're all trying to hopefully maybe bridge this a bit. Um, at least that's one of my main goals. And you know, the US Department of Health and Human Services sees this as a really important um, mission I would say NIH also sees this as a really important mission from a research standpoint to better understand these issues so that we can not only create really great interventions that we know work, but actually get them implemented in the real world. That's the really hard part. That's the really um, messy part. Um, and it's the part that we really need to talk to practitioners and community members about and understand the barriers and challenges they might be having, um, how the, these particular evidence-based programs may be meeting their needs or may not and really understand what, you know, what's the reason for this particular gap. So that as kind of a background is, is what I um, kind of use as my motivation in my research. And this is just one example of uh, a model that kind of identifies for, from a kind of a community perspective, what are the phases um, in adoption of a particular program or practice. And the phase that I'm going to talk about today and I'm going to focus on is this active implementation phase. Um, so this is, you know, when programs actually decide, okay, yes, we're going to implement this particular program, um, and then they go out and, and they do it. Um, and so it's really where the rubber meets the road in a lot of ways. And this is the, the kind of phase that I'm most interested in, in doing research on. So what is implementation? Well, implementation is what a program consists of in practice, um, and it's also the degree to which it was delivered as it was originally intended. Um, so if we look at this cartoon, we're trying to kind of avoid this, right? We're trying to understand what is that miracle that happens in the middle to actually result in whatever outcomes that we're after? Um, so unless we measure and study this miracle, um, then we're not really truly going to understand what's going on out there. Um, so to be a, a little bit more explicit, as the cartoon says, uh, this is another model, kind of the researcher geek in me coming out. I love pictures and models. Um, and this kind of breaks down a little bit more clearly for us how different aspects of implementation may be related to program outcomes. So we can think about it, impl Im, implementation as fidelity or adherence. How closely am I 
kind of following the manual or the guidelines around this program. Um, we can also think of how important quality of delivery is above and beyond maybe what the manual says. How, you know, how engaging is that particular facilitator or therapist? Um, how, how well are they delivering the program or, or practice? Um, we also can think of adaptation. And this, I like this because it separates it from fidelity. So some people think of adaptation as the lack of fidelity. I think of adaptation as you know, you're changing, modifying, making a program maybe fit your community or the participants that you're working with. That may or may not happen under conditions of high or low fidelity. Um, they're, they're separate constructs, and it's important we think of them as separately. Um, and then ultimately, these things can influence how our participants respond to the program. Um, so that's an important mediator in looking at how it relates to outcomes. So um, ultimately, at the end of my career, I hope to be able to say that I've done research on all these links. Um, but right now, for, to, to start with, um, I'm really going to focus on, for today, this um, fidelity kind of uh, box or oval and adaptation. Because um, I think it's a really interesting debate that's going on in the field right now is, um, you know, is it adaptation verse, versus, or fidelity versus adaptation? Are they part of the same spectrum? What are we talking about here? Um, and so from the fidelity side of things, people would argue that, you know, it's really best not to tinker with something that's been proven to work. So we've done this research, we've controlled every possible external factor, we know that this program works if it's implemented exactly how we said it should be. Um, and so if we're making changes to that, we really just can't, we can't be assured that what uh, the outcomes that they got in the research will transfer to the people in the communities. Uh, and also, we should take advantage of the, the lots of work and energy that goes into understanding these programs um, and researchers' expertise in these areas. So that's one kind of side of the argument. Um, the other would be that, OK, reality is adaptation happens. We get programs out in the real world. They come up against barriers. They come up with um, things that the researchers have never imagined would potentially happen. And they have to make changes. It's the reality. Um, and we can't possibly think of every possible thing they might come up against and design programs to meet those needs. So um, we have to be realistic. And, um, and the programs should be adapted. They should fit the clients and the communities that we're working in. Um, and that's a part of that process of owning a program at a local level. And could potentially, if we're able to kind of adapt it to fit our needs, that we might be able to do an even better job of serving our clients and sustaining the program long term. Um, and of course, practitioners' expertise is just as important, sometimes even more important, than researchers' perspectives because they know the reality of what's going on. If, we're, if our work is going to inform what's going on in the real world, we need to take advantage of all the years of expertise that they've gained as well um, in their circumstances. So, um, But then I would say that there's also this middle ground. And this is kind of where I'm moving towards in, in trying to better understand. Um, and I've already mentioned this, but the idea that adaptations can occur within the context of low fidelity or high fidelity, you can have both. Um, you can have your cake and eat it too, maybe, um, is I think the way we need to be thinking. Um, because it, otherwise, we're just kind of ignoring something that's going to happen anyways. And um, the idea that not all adaptations deviate from the program's original model. In fact, they oftentimes, when we're working with really highly um, skilled practitioners, they in fact enhance what the program is originally designed to do. Um, so this is just to kind of bring us, give us a conceptual background before I, I, I show you share with you some of the research that we've been doing with SFP in Washington. Um, and you know, you might ask yourself, well, OK, so what's the evidence say? Is it fidelity? Is it adaptation? Is it the middle? Uh, there's really relatively little um, research in this area. Uh, there is increasing research um, looking at fidelity in terms of adherence and dosage, that increased fidelity, on average, tends to be related to better outcomes. You know, Again, on average, there's some research that suggests that. Also, when you look to the cultural adaptations literature, they show that if you're making adaptations to fit a particular culture, um, they, you often see positive impacts on recruitment, retention, perhaps. Uh, but there's a little bit more of a kind of gray area in terms of what impact it has on actual outcomes. Yes, question. Uh, my question is, do you ever utilize the term accommodation that occurred you know, oh. adaptation versus sure. accommodation? Mm -hmm. Are we adapting it or are we accommodating the language? 
I haven't heard, I haven't used that term myself, but I, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, they, they do talk about kind of surface level adaptation in terms of when you're thinking of cultural and language issues, um, and then more deep structure kind of adaptation where you're actually trying to change maybe the mechanics of the program as opposed to just kind of using um, language that's appropriate or using pictures or images that are more culturally relevant, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting distinction in terms. I like that, yeah. Sorry, that question, yeah, thanks. Jumped right in. Um, so the question was uh, about using the term accommodation or what accommodation means as opposed to adaptation. And your example was changing a language of a curriculum or a program. So yeah, definitely. Um, so the bottom line, and it's good for me because I have a whole lot more research to do in my career, is that we need more research in this area. We need more empirical evidence to inform what, what we're talking about on either end of this debate um, as well as the middle ground. So that's where we've started, or at least where I've started, um, to try to contribute to some of the research in Washington State around SFP. We're able to take advantage of this existing infrastructure of programs disseminated all across the state. Uh, we have very little control on how they're implemented, um, so there's lots of variation. So we have some, some interesting data to look at. So um, we're going to talk about three kind of projects that have gone on, one of which I'm the lead on. The other ones my colleagues have been working on for a number of years, but I would like to share with you what they've found as well. But they all center around this issue of fidelity versus adaptation, how it relates to outcomes, um, that sort of thing. So the first study um, is one that I'm working on currently. And it's really just starting out kind of descriptively, trying to understand what's going on out there. What are the types of adaptations that facilitators are making? And why are they making those um, adaptations? I think it's an important starting point to understand the diversity of adaptations going on, as well as the reasons, so that we can potentially identify maybe the barriers that they're facing or issues that they face as they implement these programs across um, Washington State. So for this particular study, we're looking at a sample of SFP parents and the facilitators that are implementing the program. So there are 95 programs that we selected from here that were implemented between 2008 and 2012. A total of 631 parents have participated in these 95 programs. And then the, the part that I'll be talking mostly about today are these facilitator reported adaptations. So we ask the facilitators when they send in their pre and post data from their parents that they also give us some information about that particular implementation of the program, how did it go, you know, what changes did you make, um, and why did you make those changes. So um, this is a, one way of looking at adaptation. So this is some work that I originally did in Pennsylvania with some colleagues to identify different dimensions of the modifications that were happening in Pennsylvania and the work that we were doing there. Um, and so we, we came up with these three kind of categories or dimensions. So the first one is philosophical versus logistical. So we thought um, sometimes facilitators are making changes because they, the um, program, kind of the underlying values or philosophy doesn't align with them, their perspective, or maybe the community that they're working with. So it's more of kind of a philosophical reason for making a change. Um, oftentimes, though, it's really mostly logistical. So they, you know, they ran out of time. Um, they only have six weeks instead of seven weeks for the program. Kind of just some external logistical issues that might, might be a reason why they're, they're changing things. Um, the other aspect to this is timing. So sometimes programs anticipate potential issues they're going to run into. And they might think proactively about that, be planful about it and very thoughtful, and maybe even consult with technical assistance providers or the developer to try to make a change. Um, other times it's more reactive. It's in the heat of the moment. You know, I'm up here facilitating a group and um, I can't think of a fire alarm goes off. And oh darn, we ran out of time that day and we didn't get to these activities and I'm not sure what to do, so I'm gonna have to change something. Um, so reacting kind of in the heat of the moment is a little bit quite different, you would think, than um, maybe proactively making changes. The other piece is, um, does the adaptation align with or support the underlying theory of the program, right? Can you think of it as almost like an enhancement? Um, or does it detract from or negatively kind of align with what the theory is behind the program? Um, so descriptively, basically what we found in this sample, and it um, really replicates what we saw in Pennsylvania as well, is that on, you know, on average we see mo um, more uh, issues of logistical fit or reasons why they're making changes is due to logistics really as opposed to philosophical issues. Um, so that tells us something about maybe the structure of the program or um, the challenges they're running up against. Timing oftentimes looks about, you know, it's about half and half that are more proactive versus reactive. In Pennsylvania, we saw far more reactive adaptations for some reason. Um, we were working with a wide variety of programs there. 
Um, and then as far as our kind of subjective judgment of whether it aligns versus not aligns with the program, we actually see that about you know, two thirds or so are in fact negatively aligned with what we would say is the underlying logic behind the program. So that's really concerning, I think. Yeah. Hundred and fifty four. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, well, okay. So we had nine. So you're asking about the um, kind of the total n, sort of. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Um, well, actually, so this is everyone that said they made an adaptation. This is the breakdown. Um, so I think it was. In our Pennsylvania sample, it was about, I think, 60% said they made a change of some kind. Um, I think it's probably about the same here. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that's, that's a good question. I think the majority of people, and the research would suggest the majority of people are making some kind of change. And they're willing to share it. I mean, we do word the question in a way that I think opens up, you know, uh, we're not asking, you know, did you, uh, I can't remember the wording exactly, but it's meant to be kind of friendly. Like, we're not saying, they, they're not going to feel like they can't tell us that they're making changes. It's like, did you make a modification to fit your particular situation? Or, you know, it's kind of thought of as a more neutral thing. But yeah, is that surprising to you that there's that many? Sure. Did you do something? <laughs> I mean, it's just occurring to me that I didn't know if this would be 20% of all events or 80 and so 60 uh, yeah. I think is, is surprisingly high but if mm -hmm. you did word it in that kind of neutral way and left it as open as you sounds like you were to any kind of mm -hmm. change that was done including those that in their mind might make it work better than yeah. perhaps 60% makes sense. Yeah I've seen other studies that have said I read a, a study recently that um, they did far more in-depth observations of actually so they were using observational data to look at whether they're changing teachers in a classroom school-based curriculum were changing things. Um, and I think they reported only 13% of all lessons that they observed didn't change anything. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you and your team the yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you have to, yeah. Was it our team that did the coding of these? Yes. We developed the coding system and then had a group of four of us coding all of the 154 reported adaptations. Yeah. Sure. It seems like this one will take the microphone. <laughs> it seems like maybe you're going to talk about this. It seems like there's interesting clusters here that could come out uh -huh. of this, and I'm kind of are you, maybe you're going to talk about that. But it seems like this philosophical proactive negative would be the one of most concern and interest, mm -hmm. right? These are people who kind of don't agree with some key underlying factor, right. and they're planfully going against what you guys want them to do. Yeah, um, we've looked at the concordance of these things, how they kind of go together. Um, and we have started to look at how they're related to parent outcomes. I'm not talking about that today because I feel it's really exploratory and I feel like I can't really say a lot um, about it yet. But um, I know that one of the findings was that just looking at kind of single dimensions that proactive adaptations was related to a more positive change in the parent's skills over time. Um, so that on its own at least was. But the combination of the three, I don't think we, well, we could probably look at it maybe using a different technique, but um, the three-way interaction would be hard to detect in this kind of sample. But it's definitely something we're interested in. I think it's definitely a next step. Um, and you're definitely right. I think that these certain combinations would be more worrisome than others. But it's, it's kind of getting the landscape of what's going on before we move on to that, that next step. Yeah. Yeah. This is really cool to see. Um, you mentioned sort of the potential concerns surrounding um, negative alignment adaptations. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of wondering if, and maybe you'll talk about this next, and I'm totally jumping the gun, uh, if, if you looked at all into uh, reasons for those types of adaptations. And uh, I mean, I know that there's some research, it's relatively limited, yeah. but looking at sort of, let's say, deep versus surface level um, changes in response in, for sort of culturally sensitive, culturally responsive reasons, right. and that more um, sort of deep level adaptations may actually be more advantageous and likely to result in better outcomes. Yes, so we also coded the data in another way, and so I'll share that with you next, and then it gets to some of that. Um, so uh, my colleague, Laura Hill, had also developed a coding system separate from what I was just talking about, and so we decided to kind of replicate both coding systems with the same data. Um, and her, her um, 
work looked focused on types of adaptations and reasons. So the types are listed here at the bottom. Some of them are pretty specific to SFP, but um, basically what we're trying to do is, um, is anyone familiar with the Pareto Principle? I hadn't heard of this, but th I think this is really cool. So it's the idea that you know a relatively small number of types account for the vast majority of overall you know number of adaptations. So we have about four types of adaptations that are um, accounting for you know almost 80% of all the adaptations that are going on. So this helps us kind of target um, you know where we might be placing our efforts and trying to understand what's really going on with people that are reporting these adaptations because they're the most prevalent. Um, and so activities, uh, this is the number one most prevalent one reported, and activities are really, um, they're where the meat of the program are, right? So the activities are designed to be kind of these interactive, educational, um, experiential kind of experiences where you're transmitting the content of what you're really trying to get across to the parents and youth. Um, and so they report most likely making changes to those. Games are a little bit different. Games, we, they're similarly kind of, you know, interactive, um, but the main purpose behind them is more entertainment, kind of icebreakers, getting the group excited, engaging, that kind of thing. Um, so they don't necessarily have an educational component to them, but they're still designed to kind of create this interaction among the group members. Um, random content, it's kind of, um, it's, a con it's a code that we had to come up with because sometimes facilitators would say, we changed this that we changed something, but they didn't tell us exactly what, so that's kind of not very helpful here. Um, group process is around how they delivered the material. So maybe um, they, instead of doing one-on-one -on -one role playing, they did a small group activity, or they kind of just changed the mode of transmitting the information. Um, and so I'll give you a little sneak preview, because I think this is one of the results I'm really interested in, in terms of linking this to outcomes is that those programs who reported making changes to games um, tended to see uh, worse outcomes for their parents. So this is really interesting because you wouldn't necessarily think games were all that important. And I, what I don't know here is what were they doing to those games? Were they cutting them out? That's my, my instinct is that they were cutting them out on the most, for the most part because time is a really big issue with this particular program. It's really scripted and you can't go over on time, otherwise you're just not going to get all the content in. And from a facilitator's perspective, they thought, okay, well, if I have to cut something, those games, you know, that's just the fun stuff. We'll just get rid of that. Um, but we're seeing that it has a, a negative relationship with parents' outcomes. Um, and I think the literature would suggest, and maybe that model that I showed you earlier, if you don't get responsive, engaged participants, it doesn't matter what you're telling them. They're not going to really be there to listen and, and benefit from it. So I find that to be really interesting. I think it's something we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper to really understand, but um, that's pretty, it's kind of where I'd like to go next. Um, and then as far as to get to the, the reasons, we also looked at the reasons um, people were reporting making adaptations. The number one thing in this, we found this also in Pennsylvania in the data we were looking at, is time. And this might be specific to this program. It is highly structured. They have, you know, videos that will um, show them a vignette, and then they have like a time clock up on the screen saying, okay, you have this much time to talk about this. Um, and so it's highly prescriptive in that way. Uh, in some ways, it's helpful because it helps, you know, keep the pace, keep things moving along. But I think a lot of parents don't react very positively when we talk about some of our cultural adaptation work. Our, our uh, minority parents really were responding negatively to that, feeling like it was intrusive and rude to kind of just rush through things. So the reason that they change things a lot of times are in respect or in response to time. Group attribute was the second most common. So this is things like I have a particular group of parents that have a lower literacy level or speak a different language. Um, I mean, I need to accommodate to that group's attribute. Or on the other hand, with the youth, I have a really high energy bunch of kids. I can't do that activity because I know things are going to get way out, like, out of control if I let them do that. So making changes based on some attribute of the group was also quite common. And then this um, other one that maybe wasn't quite as common but also interesting was um, attendance. So if there were a fewer number of parents that came that night, some of the activities aren't going to work in the way they were originally intended. So they made some modifications um, based on the number of people they had uh, um, at a particular session. Question? No? Okay. Um, so basically, like I said, this is just our first step in trying to identify the landscape of what's going on there. I think it helps um, inform a couple of things from a practice perspective. The idea that there were four types of adaptations and three reasons for the adaptations 
that accounted for over 70% of all the reported adaptations is actually very helpful for us as um, researchers, but also for people who are trying to support these facilitators. So if we know kind of the main reasons you make changes or the, the main types that you, of changes you make, we can better help and support um, and maybe address some of the barriers they're coming up against um, as they're doing this work. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Of course, there's lots to do here more. Uh, the next step is linking them to actual outcomes, trying to understand what combination of um, reasons or types. Um, there's so much more we could do in terms of that. So that's definitely a next step. Um, so I'm trying to be mindful of time. I have two other um, studies I want to make sure I get through because um, they're really interesting, and I think you guys will really be excited about them. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, okay, so the other kind of side of this work is focused specifically on cultural adaptation. It's something that this group in Washington State ran up against pretty quickly, um, that they really wanted. This program was developed in Iowa State, at Iowa State University, so primarily white middle class families. Um, it was validated with those families. And so um, they ran up against maybe uh, potential issues when they started working with both tribal families and Latino families. And so they've been doing this work for a number of years, and they um, uh, convened a number of focus groups to try to elicit from parents and from the facilitators what's working well about this program, what's not working so well. Um, and so I want to share some of what we found when we um, looked at that with these groups. Um, so these, basically to distill it really quickly into the main themes that came out when we talked to the families and to the facilitators, uh, one issue that came out was challenges of within-group diversity. So I think sometimes we, oftentimes we make the mistake of lumping, you know, groups of people together. And within those groups, there's a lot of diversity that we have to consider as well. Um, you know, thinking of Latino um, families and, and parents, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's Mexican American families that maybe have lived here for a while. There are newly immigrated families, migrant families. They're quite different from one another. Um, people speak different um, versions of Spanish or dialects of Spanish. So when you think you've translated it in Spanish, you've really not translated it in every possible version of, of Spanish. So I mean, there's just issues that it goes far deeper than just, you know, OK, we've got a program for Latino parents. We got that figured out. We've got a, a, tribal families, too. This is new to me, because I'm not familiar with the tribal, um, tribal organizations in the state. But I'm learning quite quickly that they can be quite different in their perspectives, their values. Um, and so that also has come quite clear. Uh, also, you can think of class and um, rate, or sorry, class and income. So we oftentimes we try to match the facilitator's race or ethnicity with the participants, but then they still sometimes have a barrier because um, they are from different classes, different income levels. So that that also is a potential, you know, within group diversity issue. Um, timing and pacing challenges. We kind of keep coming back to this, but the point here, like I mentioned earlier, is that minority um, families tend to, it seems like, react even more strongly to these issues. Um, in some ways, it can be um, a literacy issue. So you might have to slow down and, and go through things differently with parents who have lower literacy um, proficiencies. Uh, language, of course, can be an issue that causes some challenges there. But also just culturally in their kind of their style of communicating, um, these parents want to take time to discuss things with one another. They don't want to be rushed through activities. They, and I think they um, really react quite neg negatively to that. And so facilitators have to be very sensitive of that. Uh, language concerns, um, we've kind of already covered those, those issues. Um, this program is really based quite, quite, hard, quite, um, quite strongly on these uh, video vignettes especially for the parents. They show them examples of families and issues that they're going through, and then you know, show them how you know, the a way that they can change their behaviors and give them examples. Um, but they have a hard time seeing themselves in those videos. Even though uh, some of the videos are designed to be multicultural, uh, they still don't see themselves in those videos. So that's a big kind of barrier, when they can't relate to the families because their house looks so different or because the people in the family are so different. You know, you don't see grandmas, or you don't see aunts or uncles, or extended families. They just have a hard time relating because they don't see themselves. Uh, there's also some specific topics uh, that they wished were covered in the curriculum. Discrimin issues of discrimination and how to help their youth deal with discrimination came up a bit. Cultural pride was another important topic. They also brought up how to talk to their kids about sex. That's not covered in the curriculum at all. Um, and they really wanted more of that information. So some just some areas that they um, wished were included that we could potentially you know, add to the curriculum and enhance the curriculum. 
So there are a number of implications for all of this. Well, I just wanted to show you one example. Oh, wait, actually, thank you. didn't get transferred. Never mind. Um, oh, no, I think it's next. OK, so practical implications. We have to work to making this program culturally relevant for these families. Uh, it, the core content is really st still very relevant, but there are little tweaks here and there that w could improve that cultural relevancy, some of which are more surface level things, um, but potentially also some more deep, deep surface deep level things. They've thought, thought through a number of strategies to address this. One is enhancing our cultural competency of our facilitators. So teaching them how to be sensitive to the populations that they're working with and trying to understand some of these issues I think is important. Um, the DVDs, the videos, they need to be um, brought up to date and also just incorporating their um, you know, faces that they can relate to and situations that they can relate to. And then developing some additional sessions based on some of these issues that, that they brought up that weren't covered well by the curriculum initially. Uh, I did want to share with you some examples of some adaptations they work, made working with uh, tribal families. So one of the activities that they do in Strengthening Families is a family tree project where you're supposed to identify your family strengths. Um, so the tribal families, they really didn't resonate with a tree, a family tree per se. Another activity was um, a family shield. And they really, again, that just didn't resonate with them. And so they made the adaptation of, of making a family canoe um, instead of a family tree. And this is um, meant to be a medicine wheel instead of a shield. So that just kind of slight change, it really engaged them so much better. They could see themselves in these depictions of their family strengths much better than they could the family tree or the family shield. Um, so relatively small change, but really meaningful. They found that this really helps engage those families. Okay, so uh, one last study, and I'm sorry, I do apologize, I kind of feel like I'm rushing through this, but um, hopefully it's interesting stuff. Um, so another aspect to this, and this is really, again, kind of merges the two worlds. So looking at adherence or adaptation issues um, and parent outcomes and overlaying uh, minority status on top of there. So you'll see some, ver some very different relationships for minority families as um, in comparison to white families. So the sample we're working with here uh, it's about 151 parents, and this is uh, a study where they did some in-depth, intensive coding and observ sorry, observations of SFP sessions and coding adherence to specific components, as well as specific processes that the, the you know the, the program is designed to address. Um, so we have 11 SFP sessions that were intensively coded for both process and content adherence, and then looking at pre to post change in parent skills um, and the outcomes that we're interested in. So we have about a third of the sample that uh, we can, would be considered minority status. So this includes African American, Asian, American Indian, um, and Latino families. Uh, so there are lots of findings. This paper has been recently published, so I'll let you go find the details of it. But I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. The overall our, our, our overarching kind of take home point was that on average, global adherence rating, so just saying on average if you, you know, completed 70% of what you were supposed to be completing in a session, um, that was not related to outcomes, the overall global assessment of adherence. Uh, what we did find was once we kind of dig, dug down a bit deeper and looked at the individual components and whether they adhered to specific components or specific processes, um, those were related to outcomes but only for minority families. Um, so interesting stuff. Uh, again, there's lots of information here. I just want to highlight a couple of them. And I, did, I do have some notes so I don't mess this up because it can get kind of confusing. But basically, I want to highlight um, two aspects of process, or three aspects. First, instruction and elaboration. Um, what I mean by instruction is, is this uh, basically is when facilitators are providing clear instructions around an activity and they are describing its purpose. So they're spending enough time and energy to really articulate what is going on with this particular activity. Um, elaboration is kind of similar. So this is when facilitators are providing good examples or demonstrating a concept in addition to just kind of telling them what's going on. Uh, and so both of these aspects of adherence, so the more um, adherence you had, these facilitators had to instruction and elaboration, the more likely you were to see positive change for minority parents, not for white parents. Um, and what they hypothesized were, was that you know, this program was developed and validated with primarily white families. Some of these concepts might be not as familiar to these families. Um, and so the more time and energy that was spent around kind of 
providing that frame and instruction and elaboration and um, example might have benefited those families that much more. That was the hypothesis, at least. Um, the other aspect, and this is interesting because this had a negative relationship with outcomes, was supervision. So supervision was when a facilitator assured the activity proceeded as scripted. So the things we keep coming back to, kind of making sure you know, we're moving along and, and uh, making sure we're not getting, spending too much time on one thing. Um, and this was related to, so decreased adherence to this, so not doing as well on this supervision portion of adherence, was related to more positive outcomes for parents, for minority parents. Um, again, this kind of hypothesis is that this is viewed as intent, or sorry, intrusive and maybe patronizing for some of the minority families, um, particularly ones that have a history of, um, you know, historical patterns of majority dominance. And so they might view this very negatively if you're you know, pushing them or you know, cutting them off um, and trying to get them into the next activity. Yes? Were any of the trainers or facilitators minority that did the actual training, and did that have an impact? Uh, I, you know, I don't know if they looked at that in this particular study. Um, in general, they try to match facilitator race and ethnicity to the participants, the majority of the participants. And um, sometimes it comes down to issues of um, class and income, that there is that distinction, although they might be this, both Latino. Um, one is a high, more highly educated, higher income level, um, so I think there's that disparity. But I don't, I don't know um, empirically if they looked at that, but that's what they generally try to do. And that's what ends up happening, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I take it these are probably post-talk exploratory analyses. Yes. This wasn't a, okay. Um, I mean, were, did you guys have a you pre know, a, a, a hypothesis to begin with? That well, there would be these I think they looked at minority status because some of the work in the focus groups, some of the people on the ground doing this work, some of the facilitators, I think, spoke to some of these themes. Um, and then Laura Hill, the lead evaluator, said, OK, well, let's look at the data and see what's going on here. Um, but yeah, I'd have to ask her exactly how, how much of this was hypothesized versus kind of trying to, to come up with an explanation after the fact. Um, but what, what's interesting is we're starting to look at this now in the data I was just showing you, um, which is a different set of data, a different way of coding kind of the, the adherence portion or the adaptation portion. And we found some similar findings in terms of at least for sure that there are differences. The minority families, for whatever reason, the adaptations are having a different impact on them um, than the white majority families. So we'll see if it continues to be a theme or not. Yeah. Um, other questions at this point? Okay, so one, one more um, set of findings from, from this study. Uh, so this was looking at adherence to particular content um, as opposed to process. And this also, I just want to highlight two things. So um, when we say involvement, this means this is content that's designed to encourage parents to include children in decision making and rule making. Um, so they talk a lot about having these family meetings where families come together and they hear out kind of all sides. Parents give their input, children give their input. Um, and empathy also similarly is about understanding the child's perspective, encouraging parents to kind of put themselves in their children's shoes and understand their perspective. And we found for both of these that increased adherence, so doing what the curriculum would say to do in terms of delivering this content was related to, um, so decreased adherence was related to more positive outcomes for parents. You can think of that opposite as well in terms of um, the relationship. but. Um, basically, what they hypothesized here, again, is that this, facilitators might have picked up on the fact that this is a, the content is a bit of a mismatch sometimes with um, minority parents' values, you know, generalized as far as um, families that might really hold uh, respect as really important in terms of uh, having respect for your elders, that you know, children really shouldn't be involved in the decision making, that that's the parent's job. Um, so we were kind of thinking that movie facilitators sensed this mismatch in the content and the people that they were working and the families they were working with. So they might have held back a bit on that delivering that content and giving room to deliver some other other content, being more um, kind of mindful of other content content that was a good match for the, those participants, which then um, still enabled them to show and demonstrate the positive impacts on these parents' skills um, because they were able to kind of adjust the content just a bit, um, not even adjust it, just spend more time on things maybe that were more closely aligned with their existing values and really drive those points home and spend less time on this issue of involvement and empathy. That's just a hypothesis, though, of course, we um, don't know, and, it, and a lot of that is post hoc. So um, 
But that's, that's, there's some really interesting tidbits here, I think, that you know, we need to do a lot more work around. But um, it, it's you know, lots, lots of possible ways to go with it. Yeah? I think this is really fascinating in terms of what the relationship is between adherence and the outcomes for minority families. But you're saying that even though that's a relatively small proportion of the total N, that mm -hmm. the non-minority families, there is no relationship in any direction between fidelity and yep. outcomes. So I'm kind of curious what you think about that. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, so one thing I've been thinking a lot about and that the literature is starting to try to unpack is that we think of implementation as this kind of umbrella construct. So adherence is one part of that. Um, and this particular program, because it is so structured and manualized, most trainers do a pretty good job of having pretty high adherence. So there's not, you know, the range there is pretty restricted. Um, and that really it might be a matter of, it's not adherence so much that's driving these outcomes, but it's quality of delivery, it's responsiveness of participants. And so making some of these changes and adaptations for minority families um, might in fact be affecting those mediators of responsiveness in a way that maybe the white families just don't need or they don't need to make those kind of um, modifications. Uh, so I think that could be one thing, but it, it could be specific to this program. Although I've found that in a couple of other studies as well, that these global assessments of adherence don't seem to be doing much, that it's really more when you dig down into kind of component level analysis that there's a little bit more of the action. Um, we, maybe we're getting better at kind of training people to adhere to certain, at a certain level, at least good enough, that they're able to um, impact these outcomes and that the very, there's just a lack of variability, depend, you know, for those, for maybe for those wh white families, I'm not sure. I don't know why that would be different for minority families except for the fact that they might be making more changes to accommodate those families and so there's more variability there. That's my hypothesis, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, other questions about this study? Uh, I just wanted to kind of summarize for this study what are the practice implications. So um, both from a research standpoint but and also a facilitator standpoint, we need to better understand what's really working about these programs. How are they functioning and how do they vary depending on the populations we're working with? And that can only help us better understand from a research standpoint kind of the logic and the um, rationale behind these programs, but also from a practitioner standpoint of, you know, how can I make decisions about how I'm modifying things for particular populations and the impact it might have on, our, on my outcomes. Um, so a, a lot of food for thought. Um, overall, I would say the lessons we've learned in Washington around SFP is that it's being successfully implemented across a wide variety of settings with a wide variety of families, um, so we're really excited about that. Um, what I also am really excited about is this idea of doing this translational research. So this is really messy <laughs> data. Um, it's not perfect, but it's ultimately I think it's going to give us bigger bang for, the bu for our buck because it has more external validity um, than a lot of our highly controlled research tr efficacy trials. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in, in trying to, to kind of milk it for all it's worth and, and, and kind of you know, take, take these lessons learned and put them into practice. So. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I'm happy to stick around for any additional questions, um, but thanks again for, for um, sticking with me and engaging. Thank you.